You know, you're instructed that with that key, you can unlock anything, you can learn anything, you can absorb anything. What is the key to David? It's a very simple thing. We've discussed it, but I decided we were going to do a lecture that in as much as there still seems to be some confusion about that key to David, that key that you place in these scriptures and they unlock and they come open and they live for you. And it's such a simple key that I felt that we would just give an entire lecture to that key. Now, a key can be a key to a puzzle, and so it is. It's a puzzle to many people to understand the Word of God. It can be the key to a code, even. A code that a telegrapha or someone in the spy land would have to put into a language or an alphabet or a group of numbers to make it mean something. It's no different in the Word of God. God has placed it to, for us in many languages, including the original languages. He has even then at times spoken in parables so that those that are not intended to understand, he would pass over their heads. But never would our Father, inasmuch as he is not the author of confusion, but peace, for those that would seek, those that would care, that he would give you a key that unlocks the golden rule, the book, his word. As Jesus said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. And he does. He's here. It is the living word. When you have that key, there is so much misunderstanding in this world today as we see the turmoil and the pains, even the labor pains that bring in the birth of a new age. As we see it solidify before our very eyes, as the prophecies come to pass one after the other with such speed that it's difficult even for a student of God's Word to keep up with daily and current events as our Father supplies again the key. Now, how would we go about really getting down to the basics of this key? Well, there were, there is one book out of the entire word that is called the book of Revelation, which means what? I don't care what language you put it in, to unveil or uncover or to open. Doesn't it make sense that would be a good place to kind of start as the opening the uncovering, the making known to clarify the Word of God. And what do we find in the very first chapters of that book of Revelation other than the letters to the churches? And in a way, isn't that what we're called, the church? By that I mean the many-membered body. I'm not talking about signboards outside or anything like that. But the many-membered body is the church. And out of the seven churches, seven in biblical numerics, meaning spiritual completeness, within that is the completeness of the fact. But only two of those churches were in good standing with Jesus Christ. That was the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. It's very important that if you want God's blessings on you, that you need to follow the way that pleases Him. Now, we could take the church of Smyrna, but in as much as the church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia means what? Brotherly love. And that brotherly love is what we have in that many-membered family. We care about each other's souls. You see, this flesh is not going to be around always, but the souls will be around however long God allows them. By that, I mean in the proper place place that souls go to at the passing of the flesh with him. So let's take that church of Philadelphia and let's really receive his instructions to it. They were doing something right, and that's what you should do. You should do what pleases Christ. He was unhappy with all other churches except this church of Philadelphia and Smyrna. Open to Revelation chapter 3 with me. Let's pick it up with verse 7 as he begins to address this church and let us absorb carefully his words to it. 
And to the chapter 3, verse 7, and the, the, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, you write to this church of brotherly love. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key to David. Now that's our subject. Do you have it or don't you? You either do or you don't. There are really no half ways. Well, let's analyze. Let's check it out. He that openeth and no man shutteth. And that means exactly what it says. If you have the key to David in your mind, God can open doors for you and no human being can slam that door shut on you. It's an open door to knowledge that no one can rob you of. No one can take it away from you. In other words, we could classify it as the truth and facts of God. That is not up for debate. It's open. It's an open and shut case, if I may paraphrase it in that way. And shutteth and no man openeth. In other words, you can shut the door to deception and lies that men sometimes like to rain down upon this earth. And you can document, prove whether it's truth or a lie. How do you do that? By the key of David or the key to David. All right, let's continue on. Verse 8, listen carefully. If you want to know how to open and shut, I know thy works. The Lord says, I, I know what you're doing. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. An open door to what? His truth, I'm sure you'll find out here. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. You know why you have a little strength? Do you know why God hears you? You are possessed with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is Christ in you. That's why He hears you. The promises made in this Word are not idle promises. The promises made to this many-membered body took it from a very small church in northwest Arkansas, and now it is one of the most powerful, I'm going to repeat that, powerful churches in the world. We bear more influence on other churches. Here, listen to my words. We bear more influence. Example, we went on short wave about two months ago. Do you know how many people have gone on short wave since then? I mean, everywhere. They all went on short wave after we began to say, isn't it wonderful to minister to people around the world? And that's beautiful. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not complaining about that. But I'm utilizing that to show you the influence that we have. And you've noticed that I have been hammering on one verse Charlie's. I mean hammering hard on one verse Charlie's. Hey, we're beginning to get a, some two verse Charlie's now, sometimes three and four. It's precious, you know. It is really precious. Am, am, am I taking the attitude of I told you so? No. No, thanks be to God. His truth uh, is powerful. His truth opens doors, and when someone is bold enough to stand up and make a declaration, a man or a woman of God, others will follow into that door. And sometimes God has certain people that he must use. You happen to be that people. So let us understand this key. Let us understand the strength that you have. You see, a little strength as it says, as long as it's God's strength helping you, is more strength than this world has put together. For he controls and allows Satan to only go as far as Satan is allowed to by his children. Has the little strength and has kept my word. Has kept what? It's important, beloved, that you understand the word and keep it. We all fall short, true enough and has not denied my name. <clears throat> what does it mean not to deny Christ's name? That you're never deceived off into worshiping some spurious Messiah. That when you say Christ, that's exactly what you mean, is the anointed one of God, not the anointed one of man. That when you say His name, you mean Yeshua, or you mean Jesus. It's according to what language you're talking about, not some 
alternated thing put together out here by man and called God. You know who you're talking about. You know who Jesus is. Therefore, you have not denied his name. Do you realize that many people are going to deny his name without intention? Because they don't really know who he is. You know why? They do not have the key to David. Therefore, he had to write to the other churches other than Philadelphia and Smyrna in the way that he did. Let's analyze. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. And thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Nine. Behold. This means looky here. See. Behold. Observe. I make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Now, this is Christ speaking. He didn't make any bones about it. He says they're lying to you. Behold, I, may, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. What is this word Jews in the Greek? Eudas which is to say they claim to be the children of Judah, but they're not the children of Judah. They're lying to you. They're not of Judah at all. And I will make them come and worship at your feet. I want you to see the love of God in that. Meaning in the millennium, even the tares are going to be taught the truth to see whether or not they will follow their father. And beloved, you're going to be one of those teachers that will even give a tear if he will believe on the true name, the true entity, the true Christ. Cut out the, if you would for a moment, to take a little piece of the pie and say a name, him, him, our Savior, the true Savior rather than, who is the synagogue of Satan? It's Satan's own synagogue claiming to be Savior. All right? Now, um, they were going to come and worship at your feet. Why? Because you're at the feet of Christ and they're truly worshiping Christ through you. For you have a little strength, you have a little Christ in you and they do worship him. Ten to complete the thought. Because thou hast kept the word, kept what? The word of my patience. You've kept my word and you're all patient. That's one thing I take great pride in each and every one of you. You all have such an abundance of patience. And now somebody else is stretching the truth, aren't they? Me. Because I know how impatient you can be. So let that word fall on you uh, generously, if you will, and learn patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. A lot of people say, boy, there it is. We're going to zip right out of here. We're rapturing away. Which shall come upon all under the... How much of the world? Those that have flown away only and all the rest? No, all of the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. To try them what? To see if they still have the key. Now, what is this? You know, Greek is a very fine language to do your studying in because it never changes the subject or the object. What was the subject? It was David. Who was David? He was a true Judean. By that I mean he was truly a son of Judah. He wasn't lying to you. Do you understand where the subject's going here? Do you want me to back up a little bit? He said, have the key to the true root of Judah. Don't listen to these people that are lying to you about being of Judah because they're of the synagogue of Satan. Now simplify it. Where would those that claim to be of Judah and lie take you? To the synagogue of Satan. It's written in 2 Thessalonians. The son of perdition stands in Mount Zion claiming to be Jesus. In other words, they're going to take you to the wrong Jesus, the wrong Savior. Therefore, if you don't have the key that fits the lock to know the key of David, which is to say his birthright, which through him would come the true Messiah, not the fake. It's that simple. They cannot deceive you because you have the truth 
in your mind. Therefore, they're wasting their time to try to put their key in your lock. It won't fit. Wrong combination, friend. Satan's a liar and the father of it. The deeds of him his children shall do. You're not his children. And you have that key. So how do we find out then? How do we know? Well, let's recap just briefly what we're talking. The subject is that you don't get the tribe of Judah confused in your mind, all right? Because the synagogue of Satan is going to claim to be of Judah also. All right, isn't that very simple? All right, that's real simple. So what you need to do then is to found yourself in what the true line is. Therefore, you can't very well be deceived. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 11. <coughs> Old Testament, Isaiah 11. You see, God miraculously brought this key of David through the scriptures, wove the scriptures around that truth, uh, with that truth throughout it, whereby if you're careful, you can never be deceived. Isaiah chapter 11, and it reads from verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, now, who was this Jesse? He was David's father. Don't you remember Jesse had some great, big old, robust, six-foot-four and bigger boys? And he said, hey, those are the dudes when, the, when, the, when Eli came to anoint one of them. He run out these big six foot four guys, you know, and he said, Lord, look what mighty men I've got here for sons. And he took one look at him and he said, hey, those big guys are no good. Don't need big guys for what I've got. To, I'm sorry, I'll come off of it here for a minute. All right. He said, you've got another boy somewhere. Yeah, I do, but he's, he's just a sheep herder. I mean, he's just a little feller out here in the field. He said, that's the one I want. So you see, it was out of that stem. But what was he going to have? Did you miss that word? Rod. He may have been a little fellow, but he had a rod. He whipped bears into shape. He whipped lions into shape. He whipped giants into shape. Because he had the rod of God. And he was the master of that key. You know, it's not too hard to keep up with the true line of Judah. They're giant slayers, all right? There are no giants out in the world of them. They just simply go around it with the word. And if there's any one of these doubting Thomases, well, how are you going to do this? Well, we're going to turn it over to the Lord, and he's going to accomplish it. We're going to do what he declares us to do. Well, you don't understand. A lot of the members are a little bit weak. Well, we'll show them the way. And God will touch them when they receive the key as His reign in these end times showers down on the mighty men and women of this earth that God has touched. Yep, there's a key there. So, he might have been a little guy out in the field, but he had the rod of God. And what did he tell you to watch? The branch, the stem. What is that? The root, the vine, the branch, the twig that keeps growing from umbilical cord to umbilical cord. Whereby you can follow. You know, it isn't too hard to follow one's genealogy. Just go from umbilical cord to umbilical cord. You know, it, that's not tough, is it? We can follow the true Christ by simply keeping up with the birth process that he's told us where it would begin. What did he say further about this man through David? And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. You want to count them? A lot of people say, what were the seven spirits of God? That's one right there, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of wisdom, two. And understanding, three. The Spirit of counsel, four. And might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six. And of the reverence of the living God. Loving the living God. Well, it says fear in my Bible. Well, take it to the Hebrew and translate it properly. It's revere, love. You don't have to fear God. He's not going to tear up one of his own. 
if you have all seven of those things, then certainly indeed you have the counsel of the living God. Those things are important. You must have his counsel through his word. You must have knowledge and wisdom. All wisdom comes from God. It is knowledge then that, the, that is connected to the key. Draw if, you, if this is difficult, draw you the key of David and hang seven ribbons from it. And on each ribbon, put each one of these and know that's what you will have if you understand the simplicity that is in God's word. That is the key, knowledge, wisdom concerning this word and knowing the true Christ from the false Christ. Verse 3. And he shall make him of quick understanding. That means a living understanding in the fear of the Lord, the reverence of him. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. In other words, but the very mind itself. When in other words, Christ, when he judges you, knows whether you failed, whether you got confused and even tried something backwards that your intentions were good. He judges you by your intentions. Doesn't that take a load off your mind? Because most of you have good intentions. You just get messed up in the foot race sometimes, all right? But as long as your intentions are good, he's not like one of these people in the courts today that'll try to trump you up before you even get there in some cases. But he judges what is in your very mind, not even by his eyes if it looks like what you're doing is contrary to what is in your mind. That's a fair shake, right? As long as he'll do that, that's a fair shake. And let me tell you something, you should do the same. We're always quick to judge. Maybe what we see, well, it looked this way. Well, did it really? Judge what's in the mind, all right, of each other. Be good to each other. Support each other. Love each other. You are children of the one that is the author of this word. Four, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That's God's elect, humble people that are gracious before God. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. Did it say, he's going to say sweet Jesus sayings to all the earth. I didn't read it that way. And it's not that way in the Hebrew either. He will, when it's necessary, smite the earth with his truth. His mouth meaning his words. And with the breath, that's the ruach, the spirit of his lips, shall he slay the wicked. Well, there he goes, God's a killer again. No, there will come a time, and if you're a student of his, you know that that means at the end of the millennium. And my dear friends, there comes a time and a place when every individual has seen Christ through the millennium and his elect knowing for a certainty who they are. I'm talking about even the synagogue of Satan that come and worship at your feet. See Jesus. If they still follow the, follow the other, they got to be destroyed. You understand that, don't you? Because we want peace. And we've gone through a great deal, not complaining, but we've gone through a great deal for the wicked to try to bring them to the light. There comes a place when their light must be turned off. They must be blotted from the book, which means, as far as we're concerned, they will have never existed. Therefore, there will be no regret of them. I speak of God's final judgment. That time will come, but it will be done with all fairness. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, uh, and faithfulness uh, the girdle of his reins, his mind. He's faithful. You can count on him. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion and the fatland together, and a little child shall lead them. That's when wickedness is gone, my friend. That's when peace, true peace, has come to the world. That's when there's no more pain, there's no more anxiety. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw with the ox. Just let you know there's been a change of bodies all the way around, because the lion likes cow meat, all right, especially the little calves, 
All right. There has been a change. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the ice, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the crocodile. Tries to play with snakes. Not going to be any wicked snakes, and there's not going to be any harmless snakes. It's all going to be good. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge. Full of what? The knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Praise God, you are very chosen that you have been allowed to take part in the spreading of God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We are all very privileged that he has chosen us to see that this is done. And I tell you this, if you could read the letters and you all have that opportunity by coming to mail call occasionally and see entire families brought off drugs to say, praise God. God, we've learned more in the last four weeks than we have in an entire lifetime about the truth of God's word. Why? This great teacher? No, this great word. For the word teaches itself when the Holy Spirit touches the minds and unshackles families from slave to the ways of man, man's hang-ups, man's problems, when you truly come into the light. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. That was our subject, the key to David, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. Do you understand that ensign? We talked about it not too long ago. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. There is a time of rest coming. Rest in the Hebrew is Sabbath. It's coming. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. That's the second advent, first day of the millennium. It's going to happen to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros, Upper Egypt, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, that's Babylon, a rock of today, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. You are seeing at this time, even in the progress from Upper and Lower Egypt, from Sinar, which is a, what is Sinar? It's, it's a, in the Hebrew, it's a locked-in word for Babylon, all right? The king of Babylon, even if you would, from the from, from the book of Revelation, even back to the king of Babylon from Shennacherib, which was one of the first. But Satan is the only king of the Babylons to say confusion for those that do not have the key to David that shall deceive in your generation, in your lifetime. You will see these things come to pass. And if you can't look at the Persian Gulf today, and no. Well, there's been problems in the Middle East before. Well, answer me, my friend. Since when has there been trouble in the Middle East and you have a new world order facing it? Never. First time in history it's known as one worldism. Well, is that bad? No, it's wonderful. Because Christ is returning soon. That's about the only wonderful. Well, I don't like war. I've participated in one and two, and, and they're not fun, all right? And it's no fun even being a hero. I started to say, if you want to know the truth about it, I'm, I, how can I speak? I don't know what a hero looks like or, or whatever. I've been in combat a few times, and everybody pretty well saves everybody they can and fights as best they can. And saves all the lives they can, so I really don't know this business of heroes. Uh, John Wayne was my hero, so uh, be that as it may. But wars are not fun, all right? It gets gory, and you see sights that you can never erase from your mind totally. And when some people think they know what rough is, come on up to Anchon with me when you had to put morphine in your mouth to get it warm enough to even inject it in a wounded man. Hey, I can tell you what rough is. You know, if you want to know what rough really can be like and have to lean on the Lord. That's one of those cases where you, if you don't lean on him to keep you warm, you're stiff. I mean, dead stiff, all right? 
But then we've all had it rough, haven't we? I, I'm not poor me, baby, and I'm just saying war is hell, all right? It's not good. And as we see the nations move, even at this time, to prevent war, then what did Jesus tell you? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't worry. But, Sonny, when they start talking peace, 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 and stop all wars, you better wake up and get out of the sack because the birth is about to take place. So I would say that every red flag imaginable from that have been mentioned in the Word of God should be waving in your little old mind if you have the key of David there, any at all. Turn with me to Isaiah 22. <clears throat> Let's work acrostic of 11. 11 and 11 is 22, 22. Let's go to 22, 22. All right? I'll probably back up on you after we get there. Yep, I'm going to. 22, 20. And it shall come, come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim. Eliakim was... Uh, over the house of Hezekiah. He was a very good man. He was a servant of God. What is God telling here? I'm going to use human beings as over my house. I'm going to use them. That's what he's telling you. The son of Hilkiah. Elikim means raised up by God. Raised up for the purpose of serving in the end times, the end generation. Uh, Hilkiah means uh, God is my portion. So you got a double hammer right there, okay? And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. It's important that you hang on to that word Judah there. He's going to be over the house of Judah. He is a human being, and he's not royalty. All right? He gives orders. He gives orders from where? He was a righteous man. He gives orders from the Word of God. 22. And the key of the house of David. Underline it if you like. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Not those that lie that they are a Judah, but for those indeed that truly are followers of the true son of Judah, which is to say Messiah, Jesus. Son. I don't care what language you say it in. You're still thinking and talking about the same person. Jesus, Yeshua. 24, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity for the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. He keeps good records and he keeps them full, full of what? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, common sense. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Messiah shall come. He will take over that burden, and he is the tent peg himself. But until then, God does have duties and obligations. Caretakers over his house what do they have we just read it they got a key all right when you take over a house if, if you're gonna your neighbor comes over and says oh my dear neighbor i trust you with all my personal belongings and i'm going on the trip and i want you to go in and water the cat and gather in my newspapers and everything and don't forget to make sure after i've gone that i've unplugged the toaster and the coffee pot all right and that there are no stools running, please. That they've all shut off and everything is in good shape. All right? And what do they ask you? Where's the key? All right? Because if you're going to be over somebody's house while they're gone, you've got to have what? A key or a combination. So that's what God gives you is a key, a lock. A key that will open. 
a key that will open truth uh, to you. Knowledge, prosperity, happiness. It's all in one package, my friend. Take it or leave it. That's how permanent it is. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're wise enough to even be considering how fortunate indeed you are, because there are untold hundreds of thousands in this world that will have never heard of the key of David. Nor can they possibly have any understanding until that second advent takes that place. And I say, praise God, he's in control. But I want you to understand what an opportunity you have to pick up that key, to help take care of that house, while the master's away. To be over the house of who? It's very important you remember that. The house at Jerusalem. Who is that? Judah. I, I, uh, Israel is already gone. Judah, which is to say the remnant of Christ. Uh, you all know the, and I, I digress by even saying it, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, both Levi and Judah. I just remind that in as much as the season is here. And you know and understand and you lock in on it. But that is your key as you study chapter by chapter and verse by verse that you are not deceived by the fake uh, Judaites. You can't be. They will lead you down a road of nothing but grief and harm and shortcomings. And my friend, they are taught in many churches throughout this land as that there is no difference. There is a difference. It's the difference between Christ and Satan. That's how much difference there is. And you had better never compromise with Satan, but stay in that stem, that root, that branch, the vine that is the true Christ. Uh, turn with me to Luke, if you will, chapter 11. New Testament book of Luke, chapter 11. I want to pick it up, if I may, along about verse 45. I want to show you the fake, I want to show you the false house. Christ made it, do you know that he made it very plain which key you're supposed to follow while we're on this subject? Verse 45, chapter 11, book of St. Luke, let's roll with it. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, You know what lawyers are, don't you? This time they were scripture lawyers, knew everything. They knew how to connive and cheat, twist the scriptures. And said unto him, Master, thus saying, thou reproacheth us also. You've just cut the heck out of us, Jesus. That saying has got right down to us lawyers' heart. You got right down to our purse strings there, Lord. We have to do a little begging, you know. All right. 46, and he said, Woe unto ye also, ye lawyers. He said, If you won't reproach, I'll pour it on you. Remember the rod of Jesse, is how he would beat the ground with it? For ye laid men with burdens grievous to be born, born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. You lay a trip on people about don't do this and don't do that if you're going to be religious and go to heaven so heavy that they feel like sinners as they are, but they feel they can't make it unless they have your blessings. That's what they do. They do. Have anybody ever had anybody do that to you? Like, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't do this and if you don't do that. And all the time it's God that judges you and he judges you with what's in your mind, not what it looks like you're doing or like that turkey might try to lay on you. All right, they're called scripture lawyers. They're called preachers today in some cases. There are good preachers, and there are some that are very, very bad. Woe unto you, for you build the sepulchres, you build the graves of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. We're speaking of fathers here. Underline it in your mind. Truly you bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers. Who? Kenites, sons of Cain. For they indeed kill them, and ye build their sepulchres. They kill them, and you bury them quite well. There's just one thing. They bury them and put their last name on the tombstone. Do you understand what I just said? Claim it's their ancestors, and they're no part of that family, my friend. 
49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God. It's one of the keys, my friend, sharpen up for me. What says the wisdom of God? I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world, when the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. What generation? You know. From the blood of Abel. Ooh, now wait, 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 wait. Ooh, we've got a clue here. Who, who is this negative? Who are these lawyers we're talking about? Who killed Abel? Well, let me see. Can anybody remember? Let's see, was that... Was it Noah? It wasn't Noah. No, 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 no. Let me see now. Let me think of it a minute. Oh, I got it. I got it. Cain. It was Cain. Yeah. So his children, meaning the Kenites. So you see, I wonder how many in the room thought a while ago when I said fa their fathers, the Kenites, thought, well, now how did he read that into that? Because it was going to identify them just in a couple of more verses, see? In other words, God's word, when you have the key, is lead, it, it is sealed. It's sealed in gold, whereby he leaves you not wanting. He opens doors that no man can close on you with their lies or innuendos. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. The Kenites are going to pay for it. Those that claim to be of Judah and do lie, in fact, are the synagogue of Satan and Satan's own children. Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken, I want you to sharpen up for me, you have taken away the key of knowledge. That's the key of David. You've taken it away and put it in your own lock or fashioned a lock to fit it by building the tombs and the graves of our forefathers that we trace the umbilical cord through until you have used, moved your place into the place of the inheritors, the heirs to the promise. You have installed a false messiah, or you're about to. Don't ever forget it, my friends. It's the most important thing to unlocking the scriptures of our Heavenly Father's Word. They're very active even this day. And they will continue to be active until their fathers come. You have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and, then, and them that were entering in ye hindered. You taught against them. You told lies. You misled. So what is he showing you here? What did Jesus show you in detail? That there is a false key. That there is a false Judah. They are the same slayers that slew Abel, which is to say, Kenites. Are we to hate them? Are we to get out there and rip them up today? No, he said, let them suckers grow right on up there. I got a plan for them. I got a red hot fire from them because if you get out there rooting them up, you're going to destroy some of the wheat because they're so brainwashed that they would fight you and probably kill you while you were trying to root up the Kenites, all right? So it isn't a thing of violence. It's a thing of knowledge to know and to understand the plan of the living God, to know where that key is and where the false one comes. For indeed, he has given you the genealogy of those that would claim to be of Judah and do lie and in fact are the synagogue of Satan, the information that he passed on to the church of Philadelphia. You are in part a part of that church, the church with the truth. Don't ever forget it. In closing, one more. Matthew, I think it's Matthew 16. I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthew 16. Let's go there to conclude and close this uh, lecture, Matthew 16, the pages to my old Bible are just getting so, I like, like uh, hot cakes, trying to turn it, Matthew 16, let's start with verse 15, Jesus is teaching, he said unto them, his, this is his own 
students, disciples. But who say ye that I am? You know, they, say, they had just got through asking them, and they said, well, they claim you're Elijah, and they claim you're that great prophet, and so forth. He said, well, who do you all say I am? I understand the key of David is to know who the true line of Judah is, all right? I want to get your thoughts all synchronized. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's it. That's the true title. And don't ever forget it, beloved. Not Satan nor his children, but the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, which is to say the Son of the Dove, the Dove of the Holy Spirit. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Do you not remember when the Jonah, the dove, came down that day that John, John the Baptist was baptized and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And I say also unto thee thou, that thou art Peter, Petra, rock. And upon this rock... This is a chip off the old block. It's not Christ, which is the full rock, true rock. I will build my church. Which church? The church that has the truth. The church that has the key to David. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Satan or any of his liars come knocking on the door, even if they touch the doorbell, they are automatically plugged in to 4,000 hot volts of living spirit. Right, Satan is not happy around the true church. 19, and I will give unto thee the keys. You got it. I will give you what? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are they? Well, tell me, please, please help me, help me. What are the keys to the kingdom of heaven? The keys of David. Of course, naturally. Beyond any shadow of a doubt. You want to go to heaven? You want to take part in the kingdom? What, is, what does it mean? What is, when I say kingdom, I've told you many, many times, and I know every one of you know, but you're going to get it again. All right? It has two words in the Greek, or Hebrew, either one. A king and his dominion. And that king has some people that are going to help him. You've read of Elikim, those human beings that he uses that were sealed before the foundations of the earth that he will utilize to bring his word forth. You might say, well, well, could I be one of those? Hey, if you're, if you're a part of that group, you are as in full charge as anybody else. By that I mean you, your inheritance is the same as anybody else's in it. You're the children of the living God that possess the keys to the kingdom. And the keys to the kingdom are the keys to David, not the keys to the false messiah. And I will give unto thee the key of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What an opportunity. What a charge. What authority. When you possess the keys of David. It is a spiritual key. It is a key that when you partake of it, that knowledge, wisdom, strength, faith, trust, all those things come into your life. You know, I'm going to say something to each and every one of you. There is nothing in your life, I don't care how big or how important it may seem to you, that you've got, just got to get done with your job, your business, with your family life, or whatever. That is even one little speck of interest or importance compared to serving the living God. If you've got enough strength to put your hand on that key and put it in the lock, that makes you somebody. That makes you a person that can begin to take hold of that patience because you know God controls the lock. And that when he's ready to put the combination there that it will even bring the end, 
that every living soul that deserves a chance will have had that chance the same as you have it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you have love for your brethren and patience to know we don't want to cut anyone off that has an opportunity to partake? They're our brothers and our sisters, and we love them. I've dedicated my life, even as you, to teaching those brethren, those brothers and sisters of the world that need the Word of God. Let's not hope on our own that any one of them would be shut off before the wicked are destroyed. For if they're not converted, they're wicked and they're destroyed. But if God can touch you to plant a seed to save just one, just one, even now and through the millennium, what a precious thing that is in your life. How worthwhile. What I'm saying is, is we get so involved in our own personal problems. Oh, God, I've got it. Oh, oh, I've got more troubles than anybody. Oh, baloney. You know, we, well, what, what is your trouble? Oh, my little toe hurts. Oh, it's been killing me today. Oh, God. That, that is big, isn't it? And big time stuff, all right? Feel sorry for anybody like that. You know, we can all pray for the little toe. Little toe person. Right? Maybe that's what part of the body they are, is the little toe. What am I saying? Be about your father's business. Uh, be about your father's business. Our business is not all that important. Do it, and don't be lazy, and don't shirk it. But I hope that it's not the most important thing in your mind, that you can see the hour and the key and to know there are great things ahead. And nothing that we personally feel has that much to do with it other than praise God doing His work. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this word. Oh, how precious, Father. Thank you for leading, guiding, and directing. Be with everyone, Father. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen.